with them. Okay, so um, uh, in terms of uh, you know recent arc of the course, uh, we've been uh, talking about mechanisms for working with stock flow uh, models and uh, and some of the core categorical mechanisms for for combining together uh, stock flow models, but also <coughs> Also, um, puzzle loop diagrams and, and in, in fact, other uh, attributes, other AC sets. And, and um, uh, we, uh, in, in so doing, have been learning about, you know, general mechanisms that work with many types of, um, uh, of these categorical constructions that are co-prefies. Um, one of the needs that comes up with stock flow models, um, uh, when it particularly when it comes to the topic covered last time, stratification, um, is a need in common with the ABMs that we're going to be exploring for the balance of the course, um, the algebraic ABMs, and it has to do with rewriting, rewriting technologies. Technologies for updating a state of a model or or of a component of a model um, in a declarative fashion, where we specify a pattern to be matched, a update um, that will be applied to that pattern to be matched, and we'll get out a, a corresponding update to to the whole. Um, and Cheyenne and I talked, and we both felt that that introducing rewriting and talking about rewriting and spending a bit of extra time in it um, uh, would be well worth it. Now, you know, as we started to consider this and what needs to be covered, uh, it's clear it's more than one class. Um, there's... Uh, some basic understanding of uh, the uh, several different types of rewriting, double pushout, single pushout, sesco pushout. Um, and, and in fact, there's some, some others as well. Um, but uh, there's also a rich set of things that come in with respect to attributes and attribute variables that are... Um, uh, that are fairly textured as well. Um, and uh, and uh, alongside the theory, there's a need for examples that, that showcase this. We're just going to be able to get started on that today, especially given the foreshortened nature of, of, of the class here. And um, uh, but but let's get started. Um, and we will continue on threads of this, um, uh, I think for one or two more lectures, okay? Um, including this issue of how you deal with attribute variables. Um, okay, so to that end, I am going to uh, share my screen and I am going to go to a, uh, a set of slides that, that I put together. Um, uh, I I have a little kind of example in progress, which I I might refer to uh, along the lines here. It's it's not yet um, complete, uh, uh, but it is um, coming along, and um, I think um, uh, you know I I might do well to uh, to refer to that. Um, uh, along along the way, but um, it's not a requirement. Okay, somehow I'm not I'm not I'm not seeing this loaded in right now, so I'm I'm all confused. Um, okay. In any case, we'll we'll uh, come back to that. Okay. Um. So within this introduction, we're going to be talking about types of rewriting. Okay, and and I noted that in terms of types of rewriting. These declarative, they, they all share this idea of having a declarative pattern, which we match, and then some replacement for that pattern. Um, and they all share the fact that we have 
some general context in which we wish to find instances of that pattern. And, and in those contexts, we wish to replace you know, the Ls with the Rs um, such that the broader context is replaced. Okay? Um, so we're gonna be returning to squares like this and making particular note of what's at these corners here. But we're going to explicate it uh, a little bit more for the first type, which is double push up rewriting. Um, and uh, and that again, so these two push outs, right? Um, uh, so K uh, includes all the things in the context um, that are uh, not thrown out because they're an L and not an I. You know, anything in L that's not an I is going to be thrown out. K has all the things in G, but it does not have those things that were thrown out, right? Um, it has the things in I from G, and then lots of other things in G that were not matched, right? Mm -hmm. um, once we have this K, we can take this push out and, you know, um, uh, it's like a refined version of taking the co-product of R and K. So through K, we get all these things in G that were not thrown out, right? There were not. Um, and all the things in R, which includes some things to be added, but anything that's an I, we only retain once, and it's an H, right? And we get this updated state. Are we good with that? Um, and that gives us our applying this rule in the context of G. Are we good with that idea? Um, okay, now, um, one thing that Chris Brown helped Chayun and I realize is when you have a pattern like this, where you have a monic map from this here, okay, um, to this, you can always write in, in a, and a, and a map here, right? homomorphism here, you can always write it as a partial map, okay? This, this may seem odd, but Chris Brown notes that it's actually the definition of a partial map is this, okay? Um, that there's, and I'm gonna try to help you unpack this, okay? When I saw this, I was like, what, really? Let, let's unpack it a bit, okay? Um, so what is a partial map? Does anyone want to say what's, when I say there's a partial map from L to R, what do I mean by that? Can anyone help give some flavor? Mm -hmm. well, there's something we don't care about. Um, uh, so, so you, you get, um, you've got that, that right there. Some things you don't care about, but the fact that it's a partial map, that it's not total, means what? Um, well, uh, maps in general can squish to like they can be non injective, they can be non monic, so they can map two things together. Um, the fact that it's partial means there's some things in L that are not mapped. It doesn't map all things in L, just a subset or a subpart of it. What is the subpart that it maps? It's the things in I. Those are the things within L that it actually maps to R. I is identifying the subpieces of L that are actually mapped to R. Hmm? And that's why this is a monic map. I is a sub-object of L. Mm -hmm. It's a sub-piece of L. Mm -hmm. It's a, you, you could say subset, but it's not a set. It's a sub-piece of it. Um, these are C-sets, right, in general, or A-C uh, sets, attributed C-sets. This is a sub-piece of this. So maybe this is a person with a dog, a service dog, and a high blood sugar level. And this is just a person with a high blood sugar level, right? It's a subpiece of that. You get that? Mm -hmm. um, maybe this is maybe these are stock flow diagrams, and this is 
part of a stock flow diagram, you know, that involves the S and the I state, but not the other states or something like that. Um, and this is the full stock flow diagram. It's, it, that's a sub piece, that's the month, right? But in any case, when you have that, I is identifying what parts of L get mapped to R. It, it doesn't have to map the other things. Those are deleted. Remember that idea? So this is what it means to have a partial map. And Chris helped explain this like with, with this sort of diagram. Um, he, he gave me a quiz to see if I understood it, right? Um, remember that, Cheyenne? Um, okay, if we have a partial map from a set of two things to a set of three things, it's a partial map, right? Mm -hmm. Only this guy is mapped over. The other guy we don't specify. So it's a partial map. Uh, if it were a function, why do I say this is not a function? Why is it not a total function? Why is that? How can I tell it's not a function? What would it need to be to specify to be a function, an honest to goodness function here for this? What would it need to be? What would this need to be to be a, an honest to goodness function? If this is the input and that's the output, how do I, why do I say this is not a function? What would it need to be to be an honest to goodness function? Every component, beautiful. And I do you exactly right. Every one of these things in the domain has to be mapped over for it to be a function. Do you remember that? Yeah. If I have a function from a set of two elements to a set of three possible values, right? Um, it's as if it's a function from a bool to, you know, um, A, B, or C, right? To specify that, I have to say, what does it do for true? And what does it do for false, right? If I don't specify, it's it's not a total function. It's a partial function. In this case, it is a partial. It's just a partial function. It's not a full function. It's only mapping this one. It's not mapping that one. Do you see that? You see this picture? It's only mapping this one. It's not specifying it for this one. Well, partial functions basically relax the constraint of function. They could say they say you don't have to specify the output for all things. It's only defined for a subset of things. Here, it's only defined for this. For the rest, we're not going to define it. So here, it only specifies where this maps to. It's not specifying where this maps to. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that function, that partial function, can be translated into this. What would I be? Well, it would be saying, the, it, I would be just a single thing. It would mm -hmm. it'd say, which one here gets mapped to this right. one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a, it has a monic relation. It's a, it, this is a subset of this that is mapped. And, and then that shows for each of those where it gets mapped to. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Yes. So now I'm gonna give you a quiz. Let's see, where's a, do you have a, um, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, um, oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, so suppose I have a set of Three items here, okay? Uh, that's the input. Mm -hmm. And then I have a set of four items. No, I'll just have two. That's, that's the output. I'll be like one and zero bits, right? We good with this? Yes. Um, okay. Now we're going to say suppose this one maps to this one and this one 
maps to this one here. Maybe, maybe I'll maybe I'll make a, another one just for um for kicks. And this one will map up to here. So this is a partial function. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna call this L and I'm gonna call this R. Mm -hmm. Um should really um, oh, yeah. um I, I know. okay thank you um okay so I'll call this L and I should really use the same color for consistency this is R okay mm -hmm. and I'm saying this is a partial she's red to go between them um That's a partial function. Why isn't it a full function? Why do I say that's just a partial function? Why isn't it a total function, a normal function? Why isn't it? What's missing? Like Mehdi's earlier comment, what's the, missing? Why were many? Yeah, this one is not mapped, right? Yeah. It's only defined for these three, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a partial function. By the way, this is going to come up quite soon with partial Markov categories for stochastic. So, and 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 some separate discussions will be happening. Mm -hmm. It's a nice new video on it. Off of Topos. Okay. So this is a. Do you agree this is a partial function? If I provided this and I had mapped, it'll be a total function. But this is a partial, mm -hmm. right? Are we good with that? Yeah. Okay. So you're going to tell me is this is a partial function, and I'm saying Chris Brown pointed out that. That this being a partial function means there's one of these for this. And so what I'm telling you is that we could describe this as a partial function in set. This is in set, right? This is a set, this is a set, right? Mm -hmm. We could describe this as a construct of this sort where this is a is a monic <clears throat> map and this doesn't have to be monic. So when I say so this isn't set. So what's a what's a map? What's a morphism here? It's a what? It's a what are these? These are sets, sets, sets. So what, what are, are these? What are what are morphisms and set? They are Function. function. They're function. Yeah. This is a, yeah. and, and is this a total function? Darn right, it's a total function. Yes. Yeah, this is a total function. Monic, right? well, this is a monic. This yeah, is well, right. what do we call a monic total function? That's a special word for it. it begins with I. As a is a is It has a J in it. It has a, It ends with E. The second to last letter is V. Inject injective. Injective, yeah. This is an injective and function. The, yeah, because it's English, yeah. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> this is a function, a total function as well. Mm. So what I'm saying is I can define what Chris is saying. I can define a partial function in set with I can sort of factorize it into two total functions by introducing this guy here. And you're gonna tell me what this looks like. You're gonna, you're gonna show me what that function is. So I'm gonna draw this, okay? Injections, here we go. I'm drawing this exact same thing, I, I, right? Mm. Here we go, here's our, here's our set L, right? Mm. This is set, this is set, right? Mm. Okay, um, and Here's our set R. Hmm? Here we go. Set R. Two things. We good with this? Yes. I is a subset. Of, uh, ah, just the UGA. The the UGA is exactly right. Um. So, so 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 how big is I? How big is I? How many things? How many things in I? Three. Three. One, two, 
three. It's the count of things that are mapped, right? Yeah. It's the subset of this as well. And you're going to tell me what the what the monic function is from I to L. What is the monic function? The first to first. First to first. Yeah. Yeah. To um, second to second, second to second, okay, and three to four, right? Yeah. No, the truth is, I can turn these in any yeah. order, right? Yes. Like, <laughs> it, it, it's isomorphic, like. I could have put these in the different, I could have had this one go to this yeah, one, this just one. Just make sure that it's, it's, you know, any, it's, it, it, any, any isomorphic thing is yeah. going to have the same information, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mutatis, mutandis, a rose by any other name is just as sweet. Mm -hmm. Where does this guy map? This, this is now. The first to go to the second. The, the just... first is going to the second. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's right. Because this one goes to that one, right? Yeah. True or not? True. Okay, how about this one? The second, second goes to first. first. Second goes to first, right? Mm -hmm. Are we good with that? Yeah. Yes. And the third one goes to first, first right? Yeah. Okay. Because the 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 one that's mapped to the earth, it maps to this one, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wish there were a nice, a nice, beautiful way to to show it, but um, maybe here's a, here's at least a not terrible way. I'll leave the first one solid. The second one I'll put dashed. Ah, um, okay, now you know I, I didn't go to art school. Um, okay. Are we okay with that? And then the third one, I'm going to make dotted. Eh? Um, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me just draw this dotted. Okay. Um, I could do a different color, but I, I kind of like the, the, the consistency. Um, and that corresponds to this guy here, right? This one here, which I'll draw as a dotted line. Mm -hmm. This and like that. Are we good with that? Yeah. One to one, right? Yeah. Do you understand the information in this is exactly specified by this? Right. By the way, there's a nice thing with epi monofactorization. You can think about this, but let's not get into it. Okay. So what I'm saying is that this structure means a partial function. Any partial function could be factorized like this in set, but also in other things in general, mm -hmm. in other contexts in general, for like where these are instead of being functions, maybe they're C set homomorphisms in general. Well, we can factorize it like this, a partial map. And, and that's why Chris Brown, you know, says that you can think of, you can think of this as specifying a partial map like this, mm -hmm. where I are the things that are mapped from L to R. Do you see that? Yeah, it makes sense, yeah. And K are the things mapped from G to this. Mm. Do you get that? Yes, yes. This is the partial, this is the push out complement. Mm. It's the subset of G that's actually mapped to H. There's going to be some things in G that are not mapped to H because they were dumped, they were mapped by R, L, but they, they weren't copied over. Are we good with that? Yeah. Okay. So if you get that, you're, you're way ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, in general, uh, for C set rewriting, we are going to, um, we're going to have patterns like this, C sets, mm -hmm. which we then have a replacement for, right? This is this are really, really important. I mean, we did this for set, but the amazing thing is that this factorization, this equivalence holds for any C set, any action. So we can apply it for these very sophisticated cases, specify this, specify this, this tells us, you know, the subset of the sub object of this, right? That gets mapped over. And this too is a C set and it's, it's specifying a sub part of this. Do you get that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and and we'll we'll sort of describe it over. And a lot of the time we'll draw these, particularly for HMAS modeling, in the in the uh, context of these um, category of elements, these sort of category of elements. Okay. Right, may recognize them, right? There's one of these guys for each element of the of, 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 of for the of the set map to by objects of this, right? Um okay, and, and we've been through this kind of thing of notion of of category of elements before, right? Um so if in a schema category we have a schema where we have a object called home, an object called person, and an attribute called age, um, what would be the interpretation? If this is our C set, if this is the mapping of this into set, in the fin set, and this is what it is in the category of elements, what does it consist of? We have what? How many people do we have? Two in our C set. We have two people. One of them is how old? That's right. That's right. Um, and they do they live in the same home or different homes? Different. different homes. How about this one? The 33 year old and the eight year old. How does that differ from this one? They live in the same home. Right? Are we good with this? Mm -hmm. Um, how would this? Yeah, there are two people, they live in separate homes, but they same age group. The same age group. Yeah. Now, when I say separate homes, I'm, I, I'm I'm playing a bit fast and loose. It, if if we insist that M is monic, then they're in separate homes. If if in general we don't like, if we're willing to say M is not necessarily monic, these two people could leave leave live in the same home, but in general, they don't have to live in the same home. Mm -hmm. Here they're insisting they're in the same home. Here, uh, if we say this must be monic, then these two cannot go to the same home. So they will be separate homes, right? Monic means it's like injective, right? Um, if it's monic, they can't go to the same thing, right? Um, if, 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 if it's monic, um, each of them has to go to a separate one, right? Mm -hmm. Say it correctly. Um, that's because all four all of these. Um, yeah, I mean, um, right. If L, that's that's a good point. Okay, so you're saying if it if it's just like this. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yes, no, of course, yes. You're, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah, if we have two people here in the schema, if we have person one, person two, and it was monic from that, you're absolutely right. Here, if this is in the category of elements, they're in different homes, yeah. But what Cheyenne is pointing out is like, um, uh, if, if our schema category had two, no, 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 L and, and L. No, yes, exactly. It's in L. Yeah. If L, if this were L, 
and it insisted on a monic map. If this were L, and it insisted on a monic map here, then we'd be saying they have to live in different homes, I think. right? I don't have two persons. Yeah. Only, uh, sorry, two homes. Two homes. Two persons, two separate homes. Yeah. Then, then, yeah. Right, they have to be in separate yeah. people, separate homes. Whereas if you don't insist that this is monic, they could map down to the same, you could be considering yeah. them as the same people or the same home, for example. Yeah. Um, okay, what is the interpretation of this in the category of elements? Yeah, per, yeah, right. Two persons that live in the same home and have the same age. Are we good with that? Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, so let's, and um, so um, my, my mother's probably at the airport now, so I have to work to wrap up. Um, uh, but let's, let's talk about double push out rewriting and then let's talk about each of the others just so we, we know, but I'll, I'll have to wrap up soon. So we've been talking about double push out rewriting, right? Here we have a push out here. We talked about it and this is a push out complement, mm -hmm. right? And then we have a push out here, right? And I drew on the sort of idea that push out is like a refinement of co-product. Like hopefully that's pretty comfortable for you now. Mm -hmm. Single push out. So, so okay. So I, I, I want to emphasize here, like if if we if we have this thing, if there's a part of it, if we want to match something I in a context in a context um where there are things that might link to it like pointing at it um and we want to you know if there's something in l that we want to get rid of remember things in l that are not in i what happens to them when we map things in l that are not in i delete it, delete it right mm -hmm. if there's something in l that's pointed to by something else we want to delete a but it's pointed to by b um, we're going to need to have it now too, because if, if we try to delete A, and there's something else mapping to it, that's going to create an illegal C set. It'll actually refuse to do it because it'll say, "No, I can't do that," because then B would have nowhere to map. Mm -hmm. So we have to put it in L. So here, here we go. Like, if we want to delete this edge, mm -hmm, we're going to have to deal with this sort of context here by by having it in our little category our little uh, category of elements here um if we want to delete this edge we can't just consider one of these triangles we have to consider both here um it'll map it'll it'll say oh this guy maps to that guy red to red blue to blue um black to black and this one will map to to this one here and then when we rewrite it, um, uh, that will no longer be retained. Um, this is the K push out complement, right? We it's this without the thing we want to jettison this guy here, um, and then we can add something new in, like which is a map between these things, right? Um, are we comfortable with that? But notice we had to deal with the fact that this could be here, right? Um, there could be a boundary, another one. If we hadn't done that and we tried deleting this, um, there could be uh, there could be bad things that would happen um, because there might be another guy who is also depending on it, like this neighboring triangle. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have to anticipate there's this kind of context which, uh, which might might depend on it. Um, so, so here, often in double push out, we need extra things in L 
to just take into account, we can't delete something that's depended on by other things, okay? Shayan, do you wanna add to that at all? Okay, okay, so that, like we can't delete something that has, that's the subject of a dependency from, from something else, okay? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so we have to put in more context to make sure we get that something else. Mm -hmm. um, so here we have this extra extra thing here, even though we just want to delete this 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 thing here, okay? Mm -hmm. um, uh, okay, now, um, let's let's talk about single pushout rewriting. Here, you'll notice that we can delete something. So so here's our little square, and we can find it in context. Mm -hmm. But with single pushout rewriting, we want to we have the ability to delete like one of these guys, mm -hmm. this blue one, mm -hmm. and this blue one. Um, it's dependent on by something else. Look at that. It's dependent on by this guy. I'm actually not sure this is technically dependent on by something else. I, I need to think that through. But this one sure as heck is, right? It's dependent on by this guy, right? And that guy's not in this thing, right? Right? If here we could have deleted this um, here because it was part of our pattern. Here it's not. Do you see that? But we can still delete the blue. See that? And and it will go ahead and apply that deletion for the blue. Even though this guy depends on it, it will kind of cascade, it will delete the link from this guy to the blue. Mm -hmm. So it kind of has extra smarts beyond this one here. It knows how to fix up the things that depend on it so that it's not a problem. By deleting blue, it knows, oh, to delete blue, I have to go ahead and delete this arrow from magenta. Do you see that point? And so the magenta is retained. We didn't delete it, but we deleted it. We cleaned it up by having deleting this arrow. You get that? Mm. Um, and this arrow is deleted um, because it, came from this guy. Um, that was shown here too. This arrow was deleted. But this pattern didn't at all talk about this. It just knew how to how to clean it up right, by extension. So it has this means of deletion with cascading deletion to kind of clean these, these other things up that depend on it. Are we clear about that? And that's kind of a convenient thing. I mean, could you do this? Within this, yes, you could, right? You could have, you could have had de blue deleted here by defining this whole pattern, and you could have drawn what is the update for deleting this whole pattern, and and but you would have had to put this into the pattern. Do you get that point? In order to do it, to sort of capture that part as part of the context. Here we didn't have to put it as part of the pattern. It just captures it automatically. Do you get that point? Um, but what it doesn't do is kind of copy connections. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be a bit careful with cascading deletion. Chris, Chris Brown says, you know, like cascading deletion can lead to emergent properties that you don't expect. You can be surprised sometimes um, by it doing things that you didn't think about explicitly. Mm -hmm. Now, sesqui push out, these again are, are outside my lived experience. I, I'm just describing uh, but my my understanding. So sesqui push out has that ability to cascade delete, but it has the ability to copy as well. And I'll try to explain this as best I understand it, but we can say, hey, um uh we want to take we want to take uh, be able to here match um take a match uh in context and we want to be able to duplicate that thing we match um and so so here's a certain amount of context here we duplicate the match and that's going to in fact copy this entire thing 
sort of cascading the effects, copying as needed, it'll copy this whole structure from this. It'll carry the whole copy of it. And, and then um, that will be the result here, okay? A key thing is, here this is monic. Here this is not monic. It's not just a subset of, a sub-object of it. And you can see it here. This is not a sub-object of that. This allows for kind of copying things, eh? And this sounds really confused, like how does it know what to do? Well, it needs a canonical way of doing what, knowing what to do. And it uses co-limits, I think. So I think it figures out the possible interpretations and it takes the co-limit, maybe it's limit, but I think it's a co-limit of them to get the best interpretation, the most general interpretation. Um, and so there may be multiple interpretations of what this means. I mean, this is pretty cryptic, right? Like now, there's, now you have two of them and it figures out all the interpretations, takes the co-limit, so to speak, you know, speaking figuratively, and but it takes the co-limit of those for the most general one, for the canonical one, okay? And, and this gives a unique interpretation of it that's as mo as powerful as possible. Okay. And so that's that's what goes on here. And yeah, in the paper comments, this is complicated. It's quite quite complicated. So these are three types of rewriting. The one that we're going to use the most is this one. Okay. And I I think it's pretty straightforward. It does lead to L to kind of get bloated sometimes. And in fact, in our in our ICMS boot camp, um, or hackathon, we spent a lot of time like, how could you how can you kind of elaborate around L with extra context without having to put it in L by having some additional elements of context? And it turns out. I can say I was impressed. I think Sha Yan was impressed. There's like you can do very, very clever things if you're willing to elaborate this a little bit with like saying there's a context object and it specifies the context for L without forcing it to be part of L. And so you can capture context without worrying that you have to put it all in R or else it's going to be deleted, right? In general, if you have things in L that are not in I, they're going to be deleted. So the more context you put in here, oh man, you want to retain that context. You're you're trying to match it in, in in the specific context. You better put it in I, and you better put it in R, or else it'll be deleted. But Chris Brown has shown like, oh yeah, you can have a context object separately. It like lets you spy. Like oh yeah, I'll we'll find this context without having to put it in I and R, without having to rewrite it. Okay, this is a bit a bit disconnected, but next time we'll. We'll do some examples. Shayan and I have to work out some kinks with that, but uh, we'll do some examples and we have to figure out some things with attribute variables. Yeah. Are we good with this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so a bit of glimpse of um getting our, our toes wet with the rewriting, but we'll 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 see if we can um start applying it to some examples associated with like service dog databases and veterans and maybe we'll do stock flow or we'll do a causal loop or something. Okay. Are we good? Okay. Okay. So um I will stop the share.